Okay. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Much appreciated. Um, I'm Laura Savino, and today I'm going to talk about the Tenery Fair disaster. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it or somewhat familiar with it, uh, maybe not everybody, but back in 1977, two uh, Boeing 747s had a collision on the runway at an island in the Canary Islands on Tenerife. In that accident, it uh, still holds a record for the deadliest air disaster in the history of the world. 583 people died on that day. Most of them were burned alive. Uh, and there were 52 children. And um, lots of lessons came out of it. I was extremely privileged that I, uh, in my career, got to fly with Bob Bragg. Bob was the um, first officer on the Pan Am aircraft. He was the last surviving pilot um, from the from the uh, Tenerife accident. And flying with him, um, he gave me a lot of you know inside information about what really went on and what happened, what the pilots were thinking. It's it's quite a bit different than I think what the generations have you know what the media has put out there over the years. So I'm just going to run through that. Um, but just to uh, give you a little bit of history as far as like how it got to the point where I was flying with Bob, I'm going to run through, I'm going to make this quick, but I'm just going to give you a quick uh, background of how I got to become an airline pilot. So now I've listened to like lots of aviation talks. I've been to lots of presentations and it seems like there's a pattern here that every time um, a pilot gets up and he starts talking, they always start off with the... Um, the the obligatory picture of them as a little child holding an airplane saying i knew since i was five years old i wanted to be a pilot and this is my parents bought me and every you know christmas santa brought me a new airplane and all that stuff yada yada so i i look back at all my old you know pictures and pretty much all i could come up with was this so when i was a child i pretty much got nothing but dolls and when i didn't get a doll i would get a doll and nine out of ten times that doll was a bride and I had never met a pilot. I never met anyone who had ever met a pilot. So it wasn't anything that was in my purview. It was anything that I'd ever heard of. I'd never seen an airplane, never been on an airplane. And yet somehow I made it to become, you know, an international wide body captain. So I had a um, I'm not going to go through all that, uh, you know, read my book. But in a nutshell, I got older, I got a little rebellious, I got my driver's license, I ended up going out exploring, I found a GA airport in New Jersey, had no idea there was such a thing as general aviation, had no idea there were small airplanes, just had never heard of such a thing. I ended up getting a job at the airport at the flight school, worked my way through flying lessons, I essentially worked for free in exchange for flying lessons, and then from there I went off to Purdue major in aviation, which was really cool. And um, and then after that, it was just a matter of trying to build hours to figure out what I could do with that. There was no internet, right? And so there were no pathways programs. There was no one for me to ask. There was no one for me to talk to. There really, it was it was really like throwing darts, figuring out what I needed to do to, to become a pilot. And I did know that if I just put one foot in front of the other, one job would lead to the next, which would lead to the next, which is exactly what happened. And I did everything building flight hours. Back then you needed thousands of hours to get any kind of a real job. I did freight, cargo. I was a sightseeing tour pilot for New York City. Um, I was a CFII. I uh, was a ferry pilot, ferried airplanes. Let's see. Um, I worked for a banner towing company at the Jersey Shore. And uh, I was an aircraft repossessor. So I was that person you did not want to see walking around your airplane. Well, eventually after years and lots and lots of really horrible flying, I got my first airline job flying for Eastern and Eastern Regional. I was flying the Dornier 228 Northeast Corridor, all raw data. We flew 10, 11 legs a day, no magenta line. It was just all hand flying and it was amazing. It was awesome. And I loved every second of it. Then Frank Lorenzo came in. We went on strike. Everybody got furloughed. I was out in the street, but then I got hired by Pan Am. And I was based out of JFK flying the uh, ATR 42 which was also really super cool. And um, that was really fun. But then, you know, Pan Am went into bankruptcy. So then I was out in the street again. So then I finally, and here we are, arriving at the beginning of my story, I was finally hired by United Airlines. And by this point, I had thousands of hours, um, lots of experience, and I finally ranked enough to get my application in there and, and, and get a looking at and interviewed and was hired. So here I am. I uh, got hired by United Airlines. My very first seat at United was on the 747 based out of New York. So I flew equally out of JFK and out of Newark. 
my roots were almost uh, the first year were almost all trans pacific and um let me just show you the inside so this is this is the inside of the 47 um that i flew i flew 100s 200s in the sp and back then the flight engineer it was a, it was a real job uh, we had no computers on the airplanes um we navigated just using you know inertial nav it was really basic and the flight engineer was super busy. We did everything by hand from pressurization to um, you know, electronics, the fuel. I mean, we had, let me think, we had 11 fuel tanks on this airplane and we constantly had to like keep, you know, transfer the fuel from the outers to the inners, blah, 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 and keep everything balanced. It was a lot of work. So I was on the 747 and this picture was taken of me by Bob Bragg the pilot on the Pan Am uh, KLM uh, crash. So when I was in New York, um, I was assigned the 47. And at that time, United Airlines had just taken over Pan Am's Trans-Pacific routes, their profitable routes. And with those routes, they took the airplanes. And with the airplanes, they took the crew that flew the airplanes. So here I was at United Airlines, but I was flying Pan Am airplanes on Pan Am routes with Pan Am pilots out of Pan Am's biggest domicile, JFK. So Bob came over with the Pan Am routes to United just a little bit before I got there. So I was very fortunate that I got to fly my first year at United, first couple of years with Bob. He lived actually pretty close to me in New York and he became, I would say a mentor before that, that term was coined. I had never heard that word, but in hindsight, I was at United. It was kind of a christening by fire. Um, I was, I think, the first female in the New York domicile, the first one in the 47. And um, a lot of the guys weren't too happy to see me. You know, they were thinking they were very senior. They were going to escape, you know, this circus before this whole diversity thing hit them. And then, then I showed up. So some of the guys weren't so nice to me, but Bob was amazing. He was so kind and so generous. And he was just he was just a really wonderful person to fly with. And we did a lot of, um, a lot of, we did, this is Bob here uh, to my left. We did a lot of Hawaiian turns. We had one trip I flew quite a bit, which was JFK to Tokyo, Tokyo to, to uh, Honolulu, back to Tokyo, and then back to New York. And Bob was a member of the Honolulu Yacht Club. He didn't have a boat or anything, but it was a way to get all of us, you know, into this really nice place for, um, we always flew red eyes into, into Hawaii. And so in the mornings we would land and instead of, uh, you know, going to sleep, we'd all go to uh, to the yacht club with Bob. So I would just like to point out, this is Bob Bragg here next to me. And that's me back in my youth. And this is the first officer. And that was the international relief pilot. This is what all the crews looked like that I flew with back then. It was me with my grandpa and my grandpa and my other grandpa. And to say I didn't exactly fit in would be an understatement, but um but Bob was wonderful to me. All right, so let's get to why we're here, the heart of the matter, the Tenerife crash. All right, what happened and how did this happen? So flying with Bob in the exact same 747 that was involved in this crash, he brought me through this whole um, th this whole sequence of events um, quite a few times. He would take out a piece of paper and he would draw me diagrams and he would just explain everything to me. So I really got some, some good inside you know, um, just, uh, you know, information about really what these pilots were thinking at that time, um, right in the moment. So here's the accident, 1977, uh, Grand Canaria was the destination for a bunch of airplanes, huge vacation um, destination, beautiful island in the Canary Islands. Now these islands are owned by Spain. However, they're not really anywhere near Spain. They're off the coast of Morocco, which is, you know, Africa. But because of international shipping routes and some maritime laws that went back like you know 100 more years, Spain owned the Canary Islands. So these planes are all coming into Gran Canaria, and a terrorist bomb went off in Gran Canaria right at the airport in a florist shop. So all the planes were stopped and they were diverted and they were sent to another island in the Canary Islands, Tenerife. Now I'll just note there were multiple airports they could have gone to. They could have spread these airplanes out. They did not. They sent every single airplane to one tiny island airport that had one single runway and no place to park these airplanes. I think there were 11 airplanes in total that uh, that ended up going over there. 
So the Pan Am um, crew did not want to, to land at Tenerife. They requested, they wanted to hold over Gran Canaria. They had over two hours of reserve fuel. They, they did not see the need to land at Tenerife. They were denied that. They were told they had to land. And so they did. All right, while I'm here, I'm just gonna run through the crew real quick here because I wanna make the point. These were extremely experienced pilots. On Pan Am, there were 396 souls on board. Uh, the captain was Victor Grubbs. He had 21,000 hours. And, um, oops, hold on here. Uh, Bob Bragg uh, was the um, first officer. He had 10,000 and then Greg Warrens had 15. All right, now going over to KLM. Again, on these airplanes were the most senior pilots at both of these companies. 248 souls on board. The captain was Jacob Van Zanten. He was 50, he had 11,700 hours. Now, he was notable in that he was extremely senior and prestigious at KLM. He was actually the head of the flight training department, and he was the um, he was the head of the entire 747 fleet. And, and in fact, the first officer, Klaus Mearns, had gotten his type rating under Jacob Van Zanten. So they knew each other quite well. Now, uh, the flight engineer, William Schrader, this is really significant, so remember this for later. He had more time than both the captain and the first officer. He had over 17,000 hours, and he was a professional flight engineer, which means he wasn't a pilot, and he was very proud to not be a pilot. He had his private, but he wasn't a commercial pilot. He believed that very strongly, that flight engineers were systems experts, that they were on the aircraft to run the aircraft, and that the pilots were there to fly it. He was so serious about this and so senior, he actually uh, founded and was the president of the European Professional Flight Engineer Organization. All right, so moving on. All the planes land in Tenerife. Well, what happens is they're stacked up all over the place because there's no place to put all these airplanes. And KLM landed um, before Pan Am. And so they kind of were in the front of the pack. And then Pan Am came in and landed, uh, parked behind them. And there were, I think, uh, like four or five other airplanes just in this one little ramp area, which was sort of like the run-up apron for runway one, two. So they land and the delay is just going on and on and on. And they ended up being on the ground for about three and a half hours. But while they're waiting, um, the KLM aircraft had requested air stairs so their passengers could get off. And they got the air stairs and their passengers got off. And then uh, when Pan Am came in subsequent to them, they requested air stairs, so their passengers get off, could get off, and they were denied because KLM had all the air stairs that could reach uh, a 747. So they did eventually get air stairs, but it took a couple hours. So this picture that you're looking at is an actual picture taken from that day from the KLM aircraft. It was the, um, the Flying Dutchman looking back at the Pan Am 747 that was parked behind them. So they're on the ground and they were there for such a long time that Captain Van Zanten was getting worried that he was not, he was not gonna have time when he got to Grand Canary when they finally got permission to go there to refuel. So he decided to get the aircraft refueled. So just after they plugged in and set them up to start refueling, Grand Canaria opened. But because they had just started refueling, they couldn't go anywhere. So now while they're sitting here on the ground, well, I have to turn this off here. While they're sitting there on the ground, um, the KLM passengers are all in the terminal. They refuel the aircraft and time is ticking. And Bob says, you know, we're looking out our window. And he tells me, he goes, we see this fog bank that's rolling down the train. Now, Tenerife has a volcano on it and it's a huge volcano. I think it's actually the third highest volcano in the entire world. And because of you know the maritime weather and all that stuff, they would get chronic um, clouds that would roll down off this train and it would come over the airport. Now the airport elevation is was 2,073 feet. So while the people on the beach are watching clouds go overhead, the planes at the airport are actually right inside those clouds. And so Bob's sitting here and they're all watching this and they're all getting really antsy, the three pilots on Pan Am, because they want to go and they can't because KLM is blocking them. And they got to the point where Bob and the flight engineer, or 
went outside to walk around the aircraft to see if there was a way they could maneuver the aircraft to get around. And Bob paced it off, you know, with his long legs. And he came back and said they were about 12 feet too short, you know, for wingtip clearance. They're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. And it reached the point where the Pan Am captain started chiding the KLM captain over the frequency, kind of embarrassing. I'm asking them, when are you going to go? How much longer? Sort of making fun of them. So there's a little tension building here, right? The KLM captain was actually pretty polite about it. It was really the Pan Am pilot that was sort of doing the harassing there. So finally, they finished refueling. And um, KLM's done watching the Pan Am pilots walking around his airplane and embarrassing him. They're ready to go. And guess what? They're missing four people. They were missing a family of four. They were missing a mom and dad and two little children. So they still couldn't go. Another delay. So this kept going on and on and on. So about an hour and a half later, finally, after all of this time, KLM uh, you know, gets everybody up, they button up and they're ready to go. Now, listening to the cockpit voice recorders, they were discussing quite a bit in their cockpit about their flight duty time. So over in the Netherlands, they had just changed the laws. And now, of course, people that make laws, politicians and the public, they're not pilots, they're not aviators, so they don't know what they're doing, right? So they actually made it a criminal act, a felony, for a pilot to fly outside of their duty times. And then they enacted new duty rigs. But these duty rigs were very, um, they had a lot of different factors to them. So the pilots, there was no set time. It was something that the company had to calculate progressively. So the pilots knew that their duty limits were coming to a, you know, coming to a, a, a scary, you know, limit here. But the only way they could find out where they stood was to constantly call the HF radio company to say, where are we doing now? How are we doing now? So there was a lot of stress there in that respect. All right, so finally they button up, they're ready to go. Now, there were a lot of links in the chain here. Any one of them broken and this accident would not have happened. So let's go to what actually happened at that, at that airport on that runway. All right, we've got this ramp here that's got like five airplanes on it. We've KLM here, they're, you know, uh, a cork there. They're blocking everybody from getting onto the runway. They're departing runway 30, but because there's all these airplanes parked in the taxiway here, no one can get to 30 other than to enter on one, two and back taxi down the runway. So Kalen calls, they um, get a clearance from the controller. And this is where the problems really started. So the controllers at Tenerife were not used to handling a lot of traffic and they spoke um they spoke very little english their english was very broken their ikeo phraseology was was missing um they had a very thick spanish accent now keep in mind klm these pilots all spoke dutch right so english was a second language to them then you had the spanish air traffic controllers english was a second language to them so everybody is speaking a language in a very thick accent and so it's there was a lot of difficulty, everybody understanding each other. So the uh, Spanish controller told KLM um, to enter the runway and to take their third third to their left. And the KLM controllers uh, pilots could not understand what they were saying. Um, first of all, also at the Tenerife airport, um, all of the radios were broken but one. So they had one frequency and all the controllers, there were three controllers were on one frequency. So they had every airplane, arrivals, departures, local, ground, all sharing one frequency. And it was, it was quite chaotic. Also in the background, Bob tells me the whole time that they're you know, talking to the controllers, there's a Spanish um, a soccer game, a football game going on in the background and cheering and and all that stuff. So it was very, very noisy in the in the tower cab. And there was a lot of confusion as to what was coming out of the tower cab to the pilots. This is this is what what uh, Bob was saying. He, they were having a lot of trouble understanding them. So the KLM pilots were told to take their third left, but they couldn't understand what the controller said. So they proceeded on down to the end of the runway. The controller then just cleared them to the end of the runway and, and they let that go. Then Pan Am gets on the um, runway behind KLM and they start taxiing and they were given the exact same clearance that KLM had been given. They were told to take their third left. 
but they couldn't understand what the controller said. The captain thought he said first, Bob wasn't sure if he said third, the flight engineer thought he said your left. Um, there was an observer who thought they said our left. So they were debating what it was that, that the controller had given them. Now, something else to point out is this is a beautiful diagram here, you know, Charlie, one, two, three, four. Well, these um, taxiways, they had no labels. Um, there was no taxiway signage. Uh, so the controllers never used any terms like turn left on Charlie three. They were just saying turn left, take your third turn or something like that. Um, the Jepson plates did have it labeled, but the controllers didn't have those names for the taxiways and there were no signage for the taxiways. So there was a lot of confusion here. So Pan Am is taxiing and they figure out, okay, they're saying third. Well, Charlie one was not an actual um, taxiway. So they kind of discounted that as not really counting. Um, and then from present position, their third left would have been Charlie four. And then looking at you know the airport diagram, Charlie two and Charlie three were reverse high speeds. Well, the um, it was, uh, I think, a 148 degree turn. And the taxiway, Charlie two and Charlie three, was only 73 feet wide. So the 747 cannot take a reverse high speed and stay on the hard surface. It just, they couldn't do it. So they, you know, subsequently, some blame was put on the Pan Am pilots for missing Charlie three. But Bob tells me they were never going to turn at Charlie 3. They couldn't take Charlie 3, and they never understood it to be Charlie 3. They were going for Charlie 4 because it was the only taxiway, literally the only one they could take. So they're taxiing, and then what happens? What happened was exactly what they were afraid was going to happen. The fog moved in. So they're taxiing down the uh, runway, and... Calum is ahead of them and behind them, the cloud bank rolls in and completely encases the Pan Am aircraft, wax off, IMC. They were inside a cloud, couldn't see anything. So Bob said they just, um, it just came to a stop because they couldn't see anything. He said, we were moving like maybe, ugh, maybe like three knots, if that. And keep in mind the 747 cockpits, three stories up in the air. This airport had no centerline lights. Um, and the controllers had no ASD, so nobody could see anything. And so Pan essentially came to a stop on the runway. And um, they were waiting for this for this weather to move out so they could see. So now you've got the KLM crew. They get down to the end and they're in the clear, right? They have to turn around. Now, I would just like to point out, having been on the 747, this runway was 147 feet wide. To do a 180 degree turn on a runway in a 747 is quite a feat. I'm guessing that the KLM captain had never in his life been asked to do anything like that. And I pulled up my old, um, my flight manual. This is actually the manual they had with me uh, when I flew the 747 with Bob. Um, but I, I took out the old, um, you know, our taxi uh, turning radius diagrams here. And I don't know if you can see it, but the turning radius required to keep the uh, gear on the hard surface is 142 feet. They had 147 feet. So I just wanted to say kudos to the KLM captain. He had a lot on his plate and he, he ended up doing this 180, kept it on the runway. And at this point he was already on duty, I think 11 and a half hours. So he was probably pretty tired and he still had to fly to Grand Canaria and then fly back to Amsterdam. Um, that day. Actually, he was nine and a half hours. I think the Pan Am crew was at 11 and a half hours. In any case, he does the 180. They're in position. They're on the runway. They see the fog bank rolling in. They clearly don't see Pan Am. And the first officer calls for his takeoff clearance. Now, I know there's a lot of information out there that the pilot just took off. They didn't get a clearance. They were cavalier, blah, blah, blah. That's not true. That's not what happened at all. Uh, if you look at the cockpit um, CVR, the, the voice recorder, the KLM, the first officer called the tower and he said, KLM 4805 is now ready for takeoff and we are waiting for our ATC clearance. The tower came back and said, KLM 8705, keep in mind KLM's number is 4805. So the, the controller 
didn't seem to really be paying attention, not very close attention. He didn't even know their flight number. He gave him the the um, en route clearance, cleared to pop a beacon, climb to a maintained flight level uh, nine or zero, and then right turn after takeoff, heading zero four zero. It appeared to Bob and to the Pan Am pilots that the controller had given the pilots their en route and their takeoff clearance because Kalem called and said they were at the end of the runway and they were ready for takeoff. It would fall in line with everything else that was being done that was non-standard phraseology. So the KLM pilots responded back, hold on a second here. Roger, sir, cleared to pop a beacon, flight level nine or zero, right turn zero four zero. And he announced, we're now taking off. The controller came back and he said one word. He said, okay. And that's all he said. Now, if you're Dutch and English is a second language and you hear the word, okay, what does that mean? That means yes, affirmative, I heard you, Roger. It doesn't mean no, I didn't give you a takeoff clearance. It just confirmed what KLM had said to them. So now the Pan Am pilots are taxiing down the runway and they hear all this, right? They can't see anything, they're still in the cloud, but they hear all this. So Bob gets on the radio and he tells me he transmitted, he was talking to KLM when he said this. And he said, oh, we're still taxiing down the runway, Clipper 1736. Well, the tower controller at this point re, you know, picks up his mic to transmit, I guess had some second thoughts or whatever, and said, stand by for a takeoff, I will call you. Now, these two transmissions were at the exact same time, and so they were blocked. So nobody heard either one of them. But I will just make the point that the tower controller saying, stand by for a takeoff, he didn't use a call sign and there were multiple planes on the frequency doing different things. So that really wasn't that clear anyhow, but perhaps had the KLM crew heard Bob, it would have changed everything. I get it. We won't know. So then the tower responded. Um, actually, they didn't respond. They continued talking. I don't think they realized that they were blocked. And then they said, Pop Alpha 1736, report when runway clear. Well, Who's Papa Alpha? It was Clipper. They were always Clipper. Every single transmission, they were Clipper. Papa Alpha, that's like the name of a taxiway. That that didn't it, that did not set off any red flags in the KLM cockpit because there were so many planes in the frequency at this point. Actually, they had started their takeoff roll. They were committed to taking off, and you know you've got your feelers up for your call sign and something that's pertinent. But Papa Alpha, it didn't register. And Pan Am came back, Bob, and he said, I don't know, it keeps doing that. He said, okay, we'll report clear. Now, Bob messed up here in that he also did not say Clipper in this second transmission. All right, so now to the Pan Am cockpit. So this is, this is, this is where it gets personal. So I'm sitting in the 747, the exact same 747 that that Bob was in and I'm sitting in his seat and he starts bringing me through everything that they're thinking while they're sitting on the runway. And he's bringing me through like the whole cockpit and everything he was doing. And I'm sitting there in his seat and I'm thinking, oh my God, it's kind of hard. It was hard to hear it all actually. So they're sitting there and he he looks down the runway and they're, and they're looking for KLM because they heard KLM say that they were taking off. He looks down the runway and he sees KLM's lights. Now, the first second that Bob saw him, he was like, you know, Laura, that was okay. He goes, we knew they were there. And, you know, the 47's got bright lights and we weren't really sure where we were, how close we were to the end. And so it didn't really trigger anything immediately. But then he looked and he sees the lights are, you know, doing this. What does that mean? What does that mean when the lights are bouncing? It means that the airplane's rolling is what it means. And so Bob suddenly realized and, and Vic, the captain realized, everybody realized, oh my God, oh my God, Kalem is rolling. Bob starts screaming, get off, get off, get off. Now, Victor, at this point now, like I said, they were at um, uh, ground idle. So uh, 
The engines were completely spooled back. Vic, the captain, he firewalled it. He put the tiller full in. And they had, I think, eight and a half seconds before impact. And in that time, they were able to pivot the aircraft, but they could not get the engine spooled up. They could get no forward momentum. Um, it takes, I'm trying to think like back. It takes like, those are old Pratt & Whitney engines. It would take like a good 12 seconds to really get a response out of those engines. And so they were able to pivot the aircraft, um, but they were not able to move it out of the way. So KLM, uh, rolling down the runway, they did see uh, Pan Am uh, about, about nine seconds before impact. And the captain tried desperately, desperately to get that aircraft off the ground. It, he had been doing a reduced power takeoff. So he, he slammed the throttles forward. He firewalled it. He yanked back and um, boy, he, he came close. Boy, he really came close. He, he got the aircraft up off the ground. He got the nose over Pan Am. The cockpits cleared each other. The nose landing gear cleared each other. Most of the engines cleared, but then the landing gear caught the top of the Pan Am aircraft. And, and that was it. Um, looking back at the flight data recorder, they found at moment of impact, uh, the KLM aircraft was 23 degrees nose up. It was in a six degree left bank. And uh, in the investigation, they found a 72 foot gouge in the runway center line uh, from a tail strike. He had dragged that tail for 72 feet trying to get the aircraft in the air. And they only missed clearing Pan Am by 20 feet. If they had not put that fuel on, that wouldn't have been a problem at all. They were just too heavy to clear them. And of course, obviously if they hadn't put the fuel on, they wouldn't have been late to begin with. So, they impacted them. And listening to the um, cockpit voice recorder, the last sound before the, before the tapes end in both aircraft, on the Pan Am aircraft, it was the takeoff warning horn because they were at you know, full thrust and obviously weren't in the takeoff configuration yet. And the very last sound with the takeoff warning horn was the incredibly loud piercing sound of the KLM uh, engine, uh, number one engine passing right over the cockpit and just barely missing it. And on the KLM cockpit voice recorder, the very last sound um, was the captain's scream right at impact. All right, so, they get hit and Bob is in the cockpit and he he's looking out the window and he sees Kalem coming at them and he sees the engine just fill their entire windscreen. And as a, just as a reflex, without even thinking about it, he ducked, he just ducked, you know, behind the instrument panel and it ends up the captain actually also ducked. Uh, I guess just, you know, survival instinct kicks in. And when Bob sat back up, he heard like a loud scraping noise. He heard, he, he felt the thump. He felt the airplane kind of like went up in the air and dropped, but it was pretty uneventful. It kind of sounded like a bomb went off and it was just quick, it was over. And he thought, oh my God, you know, we survived, like Kalem cleared us. He really thought that. He thought that Kalem had cleared them. He sits back up and he looks around and he realizes that he is alone. He's the only one in the cockpit. The captain um, ends up had fallen through the floor of the cockpit, through the floor of the first class cabin and was in the cargo bay with a flood attendant who also fell through the floor and in the fire. He did survive. Um, the flight engineer was actually still buckled in his seat, but his seat had been thrown and flipped and he was hanging upside down in the first class cabin. He also was able to get out and survive. Um, Bob looked back and he could see the upper deck was gone and he could see uh, all the passengers in their seats and there was no top to the airplane. And he was just looking at this and he, he kind of went into shock. He, it was just so stunning. 
And again, his training kicked in instinct. He, he reached up to pull the fire handles because the engines, he could see the engines, the engines were still spinning and um, there was nothing there. It was just, there was just nothing there. And then Bob tells me he was on the ground. And it's interesting because he said, you know, Laura, he said, I, like, I just say, like I jumped because that's just what's easy to say. He said, the truth is, he goes, I, I don't know how I got on the ground. I don't know. I don't know. I might've fallen out. Like the plane was just disintegrating around him. So he doesn't know if he fell out or if he jumped, he really doesn't know, but he did have a broken ankle. So maybe he jumped. He doesn't know. But in any case, he didn't know he had a broken ankle, not for a while. So he, he hit the ground and he tells me almost joking. He goes, I just took off running. He goes, I, I don't know where I was going. I wasn't thinking. He goes, I just, I hit the ground. He goes, I just started running. I just was running faster than I've ever run in my life on a broken ankle. I had no idea he had a broken ankle. And then he, he finally stopped and he pulled himself together. And he was like, what are you doing? Stop. He turned around. And when he turned around, this is what he saw. He saw his airplane. It was burning. He saw passengers jumping out of the side of the airplane into the fire and the engines were still spinning. And the number two engine was right there sucking people in. So he, he suddenly just got his wits about him and he ran back and he ran, he said harder, even harder than he ever ran in his life. He ran back and he just started yanking people out of the fire. This is Bob. He just was desperately trying to pull people out of the fire, trying to get people to not jump in front of the engine, trying to tell people, walk down the wing and jump, don't jump here. Um, there was one opening in the airplane um, door, I think L2 opened, and there was like a big crack in the airplane where people were jumping out of. Now the passengers on the Pan Am plane, for the most part, were alive. There was so much debris that they just couldn't get out of the airplane. None of the doors were opened in the fuselage. I'll note too also on the KLM aircraft, the autopsy showed that the majority of people were still sitting in their seats with their seatbelts fastened, uninjured, and were burned to death because that airplane came back down on the runway about 1,500 feet later, right on the center line, and um, the wings immediately exploded because they were, you know, had full fuel, and the the inferno um, was so sudden and so severe that they didn't get a single door open on the KLM aircraft. So all the people were stuck inside the fuselage and they just they just couldn't get out and they couldn't get away from the fire. All right, so, so Bob is searching, trying to get people um, out of the fire. And he tells me he's waiting for the fire trucks to come. He's waiting for ambulance, he's waiting for EM, he's waiting for something and nobody came. And he was just like, what the hell? Like, where are the fire trucks? Why is nobody coming? And this just went on and on and on for quite a long time. And um, it ends up that the controllers were completely unaware that they were missing two 747s. They did not call the fire trucks. They did not crush the crash button. It wasn't until a pilot in another airplane at the airport called the tower and said, you know, there's a big fire on the runway. And it was then that the controllers called the crash trucks but the controllers believed initially that um, they heard the explosions. They heard two explosions. They heard the initial impact and then they heard the KLM crash into the runway. They believed that um, the terrorists had come to Tenerife and that it was a terrorist bomb. And they actually were discussing evacuating the tower. Um, and then that's when they got, you know, they um, called the fire trucks and they figured out that, uh, you know, maybe it wasn't a terrorist bomb. But they never told the fire trucks that there were two airplanes and the airplanes were missing. And so the fire trucks, when they did arrive, the, the you know, um, the only way to get into the airport was through the entrance gates, which were all the way down at the end by runway one two, where both the airplanes had entered the runway to begin with. And when the fire trucks arrived, and a lot of them arrived in ambulances, they got to KLM, which was an airplane that was burning, and they stopped there and they didn't go any further because they didn't know there was another airplane involved. And so they weren't looking for another airplane. It wasn't until some time passed and the fog lifted that they then saw, oh, 
down the runway, 1500, you know, 1500 feet, there's a second air, what the heck, there's a second airplane? They were never told there was a second airplane. So they went down there. And at that point, you know, there's really nothing they could do. It was all said and done. Um, Bob ended up going to the hospital in a taxi cab. He liked to joke that the cab driver was driving so crazy that he was afraid he was going to die on the drive to the hospital after surviving a, a plane crash. All right. So that was basically, um, you know, his experience there. Uh, now let's talk about the lessons. Here, let me just run through this. So this is, this was Pan Am before, and this was Pan Am after. All right. This was KLM before. And this was KLM after. And these are the passengers after. They built um, 583 coffins, whether they had a body or not. And um, yeah, the Spanish army came in and uh, ended up, I think they took like a thousand military troops to eventually clear the debris and to do all this. It was a, a, a horrific task. All right. so. Let's run through our, our links here and lessons learned and what really caused this accident. So we have 583 people dead, right? So such a, such, just such a chain of things that went wrong. Um, just such a chaotic mess here, one thing after another. First of all, terrorist bomb. Nobody was even supposed to be in Tenerife. Nobody was even supposed to be there to begin with, okay? And then, KLM was parked in such a position that Pan Am was blocked behind them. You know, that wasn't planned. And then KLM decides to refuel. Okay, that caused a delay, um, which made them too heavy to, you know, to, to clear Pan Am and increase obviously their, um, their you know, takeoff distance and uh, speed and all that. And then of course that delay also caused the fog to move in. So then they had the bad weather. There was no taxiway signage. There was nothing labeled Charlie one, Charlie two, Charlie three. So everybody was confused as to where they were supposed to get off the runway. Centerline lights were out of service. So Pan Am couldn't see the runway. So they couldn't continue taxiing. Um, the transmissions were blocked, key transmissions. And then when the controller said, you know, um, report clear, he didn't say Clipper, he said Papa Alpha, didn't register to anybody. The bottom line, it was just a communication disaster. Good airplanes, good pilots, communication just from beginning to end just sunk these guys. All right, so now let's talk about what the uh, what the uh, KLM crew is doing. This is the KLM cockpit voice recorder. So now they turn around, they do their 180, they're on the runway, right? I'm thinking, boy, this KLM captain, he's like, we're out of here now. Like we've accomplished everything. Everything's behind me. I think he was a little embarrassed. Um, very long day. He, he was talking about his wife was going to be so worried because a bomb went off in Tenerife and he had no way of getting a hold of her to let her know that he wasn't there. So, you know, he was very human and he just did this 180 degree turn on the runway, which I'm guessing he was patting himself on the back for that and thinking, all right, I'm in takeoff mode now. Like all this ground stuff is behind me. So they call the tower for their um, clearance, right? And this is the thing. Bob tells me that he believed that KLM had gotten a takeoff clearance. And he believed that it was just very confusing. And it was very reasonable for the KLM crew to think they were clear for takeoff. But then he was part of the investigation. And during the investigation, he got to listen to the cockpit voice recorders. And he said that when he listened to the KLM cockpit voice recorder, he was sickened by it. And he was sickened by it because there was new information that came out. So listening to the cockpit voice recorder, after they started their takeoff brawl, the KLM flight engineer, and let me remind you, this was a professional flight engineer, started his own found, you know, organization, highly respected, more hours than the captain and the first officer. He said to the captain, he and to the first officer, he was sitting in the center, so he said it to both of them. He asked the question, well, is he not clear then? 
And the first officer and the captain answered him at the exact same time. They actually blocked each other. The first officer said, yeah, yes. And the KLM captain said, what did you say? Because he didn't, he didn't hear him. And the KLM flight engineer asked again, is he not clear, that Pan American? And the KLM captain said, oh, yeah, 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 he's clear. He just, he said the same thing the first officer said. And then what, 12 seconds later, you hear the captain scream, and that was the end of the cockpit voice recorder. So the flight engineer, it's not like he shook him on the shoulder and said, hey, you know, Pan Am's still on the runway, but he questioned it. He brought it to the captain's attention. But the captain and the first officer equally, both of them were absolutely convinced that they had to take off clearance. And they absolutely were convinced that Pan Am was off the runway. And I say this because the captain wasn't suicidal. He didn't want to die. And he wasn't a mass murderer. He didn't want to kill 583 people. He believed that they had been cleared for takeoff. Why did he believe that? So that's that's where the big lesson is here. That's like, that's the big takeaway. So let's figure this out. So for the first time ever, NASA came in and they did what was called a human factors um, study. Now, again, this was back before the term human factors was coined and it was a very new concept, but they were trying to figure out how it was that these very experienced pilots could have been so mistaken. Why do they think Pan Am was off the runway? Why do they think they had to take off clearance? How do these mistakes happen? And there was a lot of reasons, but studying the KLM captain, who's a super experienced senior guy. And honestly, like if you talk to anybody that trained under him or that knew him, he had a very good reputation for being easy, you know, laid back, friendly, a good instructor. Um, he wasn't the tyrant, um, but he definitely was mistaken here. And so they figured out in this human factor study, there were a few things going on here. One, the pressure he was under, the, the criminalization, he had to go. If he didn't go, you know, there was going to be huge ramifications. He was worried about his wife. But there was also what they call training syndrome. And anyone who's an airline pilot knows what that is. It's when you're at the training center, nothing's realistic, right? You don't have your traffic controllers. There's never anybody on the runway. You have four hours to get all your maneuvers in and you're just like checking them off, getting through them. And then, you know, once you accomplish one thing, you know, you hit the magic button, you reset, you get to do it again or whatever it is that the next, you know, maneuver is that you have to do. And this captain had been in the training center, I think for six years, and he had not actually been in an airplane for 12 weeks. That is a long time, that is months without any realistic flying. And so he was not, you know, really current when it comes to, and, you know, picturing uh, traffic, um, communication problems, um, other airplanes being in your way, because none of that existed in his world. And so it just wasn't in his purview. And they also found that he had what was called expectation bias, which is just what it sounds like. It means he called for takeoff clearance. He assumed that what he got was a takeoff clearance. The controllers say that it was not. Of course, you know, dead men tell no lies. So the controllers can, you know, you can have whatever version you want because they are not able to ask the KLM crew what they were thinking or what they, you know, what they perceived or what they were asking. But the expectation was that they called for takeoff clearance. They were given one, whether they were or not, that's what they thought they heard. That's what they were expecting. Obviously, Pan Am wouldn't be on the runway if they were given a takeoff clearance. So they were expecting that the runway was clear. And so, you know, for those reasons, and then of course you have the, um, the whole language barrier. And I found like I've flown to lots of lots and lots of foreign countries and um, controllers are amazing. Everybody speaks English all around the world. This was back in 1977. I think the rules were not nearly as specific, um, you know, as they are today. Now that language is not a problem, but at the time they really didn't have a whole lot of rules as far as, um, you know, speaking English. 
And I found, you know, when I'm at like foreign airports, sometimes you kind of like um, comply instead of clarify because it's so confusing. You just sort of do what you were told to do rather than question it or ask for something else. And, you know, that could have been going, that could have been going on here. I know Bob told me in the Pan Am cockpit, that was definitely happening to them. They were just trying to comply because there was no conversation to be had. So, so this happened. So what, um, how do we benefit from this? Because God knows we have to get something positive out of this tragedy, right? So NASA did this study and um, actually nothing came of it. Nothing came of it. And then one year later, United Airlines, crashed a DC-8 into Portland, Oregon. And um, I won't get to all the details of that crash, it's a whole nother presentation, but the bottom line is the DC-8, just like the 747 and you know all those aircraft at that time, the flight engineer is the only one that had any information regarding fuel. So no one knew how much fuel was on the airplane other than the flight engineer and then flying pilots if they were told by the flight engineer or you know if they asked. So they were coming into land in Portland. They had a gear problem. They actually did have a gear problem. They went out to hold. They were still in the landing configuration. So they were burning through a lot more fuel than they realized, which was a mistake. The captain was very focused on, on troubleshooting the gear problem and they flew until they ran out of fuel. So now United Airlines got really upset about this because they had a very experienced crew crash a perfectly good airplane, you know, the, no reason this plane went down and killed a bunch of people. And so United got very serious and they, they, they did a lot of research uh, on their own. And they found that the only reason why this airplane crashed was because there was a communication disaster in that cockpit. They just weren't talking to each other. They just weren't talking to each other. The flight engineer knew how much fuel there was. He kind of hinted a little bit, but he didn't just say, hey, captain, we don't have fuel. That communication just didn't happen. And so United decided we need to nip this in the bud. And they started a program, a brand new concept. It was actually um, a revolution in thinking when it comes to flight training. Um, it's what we now call CRM. At the time, they called it, I remember, because this is what it was called when I went through the training, um, CLR, which was Cockpit Leadership Resources. It had, it's had a few names over the years, but now they've settled on CRM, Cockpit Resource Management. And basically what that means is that you have lots and lots of um, qualified professionals in that cockpit and in the cabin, and you're going to use all your resources. And it makes life a lot easier for the captain. You know, you have a little bit less pressure on you um, because now you're a team and everybody's working together. And um, there's no more of this like hierarchy, which I think that whole like hierarchy environment where the captain knows everything and everybody's just subservient to him. I think that just kind of came over from the military and the airlines just decided, you know what, that is just not working for us. So they started this program and um, now in training, we all go through CRM training. And by the way, CRM training is not so bad for marriages, either relationships, just saying the philosophy behind it's pretty good for life. And then the CRM that eventually developed into AQP, which is our um, advanced qualifications program, which also, stemming from Tenerife in these accidents, basically in a nutshell, that means that pilots, when they're in training, once they have established that they can fly an airplane, they're working for an airline, now they're going to have to start practicing things that are going to kill them, that have killed other people. And basically, they just start getting the do-over that other pilots who had made mistakes probably wish they could have gotten. And so we practice you know, incidents and accidents in our flight training through the AQP program. So that we're ready for real, you know, real life situations that other pilots have faced. Um, and then when it's our turn, we've already seen it and practiced it. And those maneuvers are continually changing. All right. And to prove that CRM and AQP work, um, a few years later after that, a um, United 232 with Al Haynes, I think that was a, a DC-10 going into Sioux City, lost all their hydraulics. And none of the three pilots up front knew what to do. And it ends up, there was a Czech airman for the DC-10 sitting in the back in the cabin. And the captain brought him up. And this Czech airman kind of took over and figured out that he took the flight engineer seat, moved him, and he figured out that he could maneuver the aircraft just using the throttles. And the captain let him 
let him do it, welcomed it. They worked together as a team and they saved a lot of lives. And so CRM um, has really changed the way that cockpits are managed and for, for the better. And so is AQP. All right, so that's that's it for my presentation. Um, I am I did write this book, Jet Boss, and you know, basically if you just want to know like what pilots are really thinking and feeling and doing inside the cockpit, that's what this is about. It's just sort of like the human aspect of it. And it's also just like an encouraging push because lots of people start off in life someplace that's not anywhere near where they want to be. And um, not everybody wants to fall, in, you know, follow in the footsteps of their parents. And, you know, if I could do it, God, anybody can do it. And so that kind of brings you through that. It's just an encouraging push. And that's it. I have a YouTube channel now. I'm starting to do some part 121 airport uh, airplane uh, incidents and accident analysis. And uh, I have a website and I'll just say on the last tab, the You Can Fly tab, I've got links to, I think, over $6 million in aviation scholarships. If you know anybody who wants to flight train and they don't have the money, there's money out there. So you just have to find all these, all these you know, people that are giving away free money. One question. Why do you think the KLM captain has been portrayed so poorly in numerous documentaries and accounts of this accident? I recall one documentary depicting the KLM captain as being fed up with the controllers and deciding to take off without a clearance, admittedly unbelievable. Right. So there's two reasons for that. Um, one is because the Spanish authorities, their equivalent of the NTSB, they had complete control authoritarian control over the report. And that's the information that they put out. They never mentioned the soccer game going on the entire time in the background. They never mentioned any of the mistakes that the controllers made. Um, they actually made the controllers out to be heroes. And they they blamed the Pan Am pilots for missing their turn. And they blamed the KLM captain for taking off without a clearance. So a big part of it is simply that the, pers the politically, the people behind the report did not put out an accurate report. And then the second reason is, boy, what a great story that is, right? Oh, the KLM captain killed 583 people because he was an asshole. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. The media just picked up on that. It was a fantastic story, better than a movie. And that's just the story that like, you know, it's like, um, you know, just like folklore and, and it's never really been cleared up. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Have a good night.